This question of the last common ancestor, though, is a I think a much more complex question than people realize. In the case of humans, we understand that there is I I don't I don't remember what the technical term for her is, but we all have a common mother ancestor sometime back in Africa. I don't know if it's a a couple hundred thousand years ago, something on this order. Maybe you want to correct me there, but yeah, it's something called mitochondria. Yes, exactly. That suggests that all of our mitochondria and are descended from a a single woman, but, but that's not quite the same concept. That's what I was going to get to. So am I right that it would not nearly be so simple as drawing a straight line from these early organisms to humans in a tree of life diagram? Because if I am right, I think it would be interesting to touch just briefly on the notion of like horizontal transfer or otherwise how we might be thought of as chimeras or compositions, because even the mitochondria that you just mentioned indicate that this process is not entirely linear yeah no those those are good questions and and i think when i say the last common ancestor of it can be of of humans it can be of mammals it can be you you know you you name it that's really a phylogenetic concept which is to say that you know through a combination of anatomy morphology and molecular biology we are building uh uh, an ever more refined sense of the genealogical or evolutionary relationships among extant organisms. And if we have that, you know, if we know, you know, the evolutionary relationships of among all mammals, for example, we can make some reasonable insight in, insights or with some, you know, reasonable thoughts about features that the last common ancestor of all mammals might have had. We may not know it in detail, but we would suggest that it had hair, it had mammary glands, it had certain kind of teeth, certain kind of bone structures, that sort of thing. And so that's really what we're we're talking about. And when we talk about the last common ancestor of all cells, at the very least, it had proteins, it had DNA, it had a, you know, a genome, it had lipids, it had various types of 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 physiological pathways um and all again all that really comes from looking at the features of its descendants and then sort of logically going down through the tree to see which ones must must have been there already at the basal node of of that tree so that that's i think what yeah yeah what i'm what i'll just put my own spin on what i'm getting at is that not only do branches on the tree of life split, but they also converge so that mitochondria have their own DNA and had an independent evolution uh, at some point from humans. And then at some point, the they became encapsulated in our cells and a symbi- symbiotic relationship was born. So that's why what I mean, it's yeah. And, and, and so yeah, I, I, again, uh, mitochondria are a good example. We know because we can look at their uh, sequence structure of, of their DNA, that the ancestors of mitochondria belong to a group called the alpha proteobacteria. And so if you draw a tree of alpha proteobacteria, one of those branches is the mitochondria. And that allows us to make some inferences about what the ancestor of that mitochondrion might have have looked like and as far as we know if we then look at the tree of eukaryotic life that is uh organisms that have membrane bounded nuclei the last common ancestor of all extant eukaryotic organisms had mitochondria so we can argue about how they got there and uh there's a lot of you know a lot of debate about some of those details but I think we can, we, we, we do understand that both at the level of organelles and at the level of individual genes, uh, there is horizontal, horizontal gene transfer. And it, it particularly means you have to be cautious when you make trees of things like bacteria because they have fairly rampant uh, horizontal gene, gene transfer. 
but it also makes a picture that can become quite compelling. Um, you know, if you look, for example, at uh, uh, mutations that convey uh, defenses against antibiotics, uh, we can see how those move from one bacterial group to another, uh, much to the chagrin of the medical community. Um, but again, if you if you recognize that these things occur, there are various ways in which you can dive in and try to get a sense of how they've occurred, when they've occurred, what the consequences are for the groups that they you know that they now invade, if you will. Um, and that's that's a very exciting mm -hmm. field. A, f a few thoughts. One are this whole discussion of horizontal transfer and and mergings of the tree of life and branchings it is helpful i think in in these instances to take the the genes eye view of evolution that dawkins proposed where you think of as uh, life as the pro proliferation of genes rather than organisms uh, or species but also we're we're now players in the game of horizontal transfer with uh, technologies like CRISPR where we're moving tomato genes to another creature and then the last thing that I wanted to say is that although with something like mitochondria this takes place on well, maybe again, this is a place to correct me on geological time scales. It must, it was probably a very long time. It took a very long time for uh, mitochondria to become part of ourselves. But this is an interesting place for contemporary research as well. My understanding is that within entomology, there are a lot of cases in which we see different organisms living together symbiotically in a way that could presage a potential merging of the species. So one instance from myrmecology that comes to mind is these ants that sort of ferry around aphids and eat aphid poop, basically. The the nectar, or I don't recall what the what the term is for what they secrete, but it's been hypothesized by some myrmecologists that over the course of, I don't know, thousands or millions of years they might merge yeah uh, again you, you touch on a, on an important point in a very active field of research now that the idea that you know animals are completely separate from from microbes simply is isn't true as we talked earlier um you have probably more bacterial cells in your body than you do human cells and at least some of those bacteria in in your intestine play an important role in helping you to digest food uh they have some regulatory capacity to them and and there's a very active research program on both the functionality and evolution of these symbioses i i think you know probably every animal has microbial symbionts of some type. Um, it also has a lot of, you know, many of the bacteria in your gut, probably doesn't matter whether they're there or not, and a very few of them are harmful. Um, but I think it is the normal state of animal life to have some intimate relationships with bacteria without which the animal's life would be difficult if not impossible. Uh, the same thing is true of plants and bacteria, plants and fungi. Uh, we're now understanding that the biological world is, is much more integrated than maybe was thought, thought in the past. And the more we learn, the more remarkable that, that story becomes.